glitches here. We are now ready. Firstly, let me thank all of you, especially the resource persons as well as the participants uh, who have joined. I am standing in for the President SLMA, Dr. Indika Karnatilaka, Professor Indika Karnatilaka, who is unfortunately not able to be with us right now. Uh, as you all know, this is uh, a joint pre-Congress workshop and it's uh, on preventing the next pandemic, one health approach. It's uh, conducted by the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the Sri Lanka Veterinary Association. This is probably the first time in the history that uh, in of the SLMA certainly that we are having such a uh, such a workshop. So it's my great pleasure now to invite Dr. Neranjala De Silva, the President Sri Lanka Veterinary Association, who is joining us from the University of Peradeniya. Professor Dr. Neranjala. Thank you, Professor Saroj. Good morning, everyone. I welcome all the resource personnel and the participants uh, who are joining us virtually. Important uh, webinar on uh, preventing the next pandemic, the One Health approach. And uh, we have invited. Uh, Dr. Ranjini Hetiarachi and Dr. Sudat Samaravira. We welcome them especially. Uh, they have joined uh, amidst their official uh, busy schedules. Uh, and to speak a few words about Dr. Ranjini Hetiarachi, uh, she's the director of the uh, Department of Animal Production and Health, and she has more than 35 years. Uh, of service in the uh, in various capacities in the Department of uh, Animal Production and Health, and she has a long service record at the head office of the DAPH. And now, at present, uh, she is occupying highest position in the Department of Animal Production and Health as the Director General. And to speak. Uh, a few words about Dr. Sudat Samaravira. Uh, he is the Acting Deputy Director General, Education, Training and Research, and the Chief Epidemiologist, Epidemiology Unit, Ministry of Health, Nutrition and Indigenous Medicine of Sri Lanka. Uh, may I kindly invite Dr. Rajani Hetiarachi to speak a few words about this seminar. First of all, I congratulate the effort taken by the Sri Lanka Medical Association uh, together with the Sri Lanka Veterinary Association uh, to have this uh, timely webinar uh, under the heading of One Health Approach uh, to prevent any uh, future pandemic of this uh, situation or this status. Uh, as the Director General in charge of uh, Department of Animal Production and Health, uh, which is the major state organization responsible for animal health and livestock sector in Sri Lanka. Uh, I do, uh, I, I like to say a few words regarding uh, what we have done uh, and what we are looking for on this uh, particular uh, critical situation. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, we have been joining hands together with our health uh, uh, colleagues uh, throughout the period uh, to prevent any uh, additional um, requirement needed uh, in order to control this uh, um, uh, uh, regretful situation uh, all over the world. Uh, and also, as far as Sri Lanka is concerned, uh, the first step we took was really to uh, be uh, vigilant about what is happening in other countries uh, and to prevent any in entry of possible introduction through the livestock. 
animal or animal product. Uh, the the COVID-19 virus being introduced uh, through these means. So we are very alert in uh, we we became very alert in. Uh, international transport. Uh, actually, our quarantine activities were strengthened, uh, and still we do have uh, been continuing uh, our quarantine major activities uh, to prevent any introduction. And in the meantime, uh, though the many um, developed countries experience a lot of economic uh, uh, economic uh, bad effects or maybe adverse effects. Uh, and also, uh, though many of them uh, found it very difficult to manage the situation or control the situation, I think Sri Lanka uh, didn't face such a bad situation because we had somewhat preparedness. And in the animal sector also, we, we, are, we are still alert on what is happening and what could happen. But we haven't uh, initiated many activities because they might uh, create a, a negative picture and create unnecessary alertness among the public. So we are still watching and observing, uh, whereas we have controlled international movements. And also within the country, uh, we have been contributing in controlling the movement of many uh, other uh, items. But also, uh, we, we are very much concerned about uh, uh, not uh, sort of delaying or banning the regular activities uh, to create uh, adverse economic efforts. Uh, so we, we, we are looking at economic development of the country and also the livestock sector is there to uh, sort of boost the economic development at this moment. Uh, and uh, uh, we had, uh, as the CEO of the country, the chief veterinary officer, we participated uh, two weeks back uh, in the OIE or the World Animal Health Organization uh, webinar where we talked about uh, what the veterinary sector could do uh, regarding this COVID-19 program. So we are working on it and I would like to hear uh, what the other speakers, especially the international experts, uh, are willing to sort of uh, share with us at this moment. Thank you very much, Madam. Uh, may I call upon Dr. Sudha Samarvira to speak a few words? Okay. Uh, thank you very much for the Sri Lanka Medical Association and Sri Lanka Veterinary Association for this opportunity uh, to express uh, the, our views and uh, to update on the uh, our health sector response on the COVID-19 pandemic. And it is uh, more than six and a half months since the first case and more than four months since the first Sri Lankan diagnosed within the country. By now that we are having 2,724 COVID-19 positive cases in the country and uh, the outcome is 75% of them are already recovered. And they are, we are having a very low death rate. It is around 0.4%. And actually that we are having this uh, 2,724 cases as several clusters. The, we experienced a large, largest cluster uh, centered around the Valisara Naval Base. It accounts about 35% of all the cases. And also we are having this Kandakadu Rehabilitation Center cluster, which is active currently. It is it accounts about 21% of all the cases. And also we are having a unique number of cases that is repatriates, that is directly imported cases. It's accounted about 32% of all the cases and the rest remaining is only 12%. And by these numbers, we could uh, prevent the community transmission and the success uh, behind this is that uh, we I think that that uh, we started our response very early and also that uh, we are having a very strong public health network that can be activated and can work at the grassroots level with very rapid response uh, that uh, we, which we could prevent any leaking of cases into the society 
and also the whole government effort uh, contributed very largely in addition to the health sector the tri forces uh, uh, that uh, did a very large role in this covid-19 uh, country response and also the intelligence services uh, contributed the, especially in contact tracing and also other sectors has the contribution including the education sector and also that we had the very unique uh, control measures one thing is that mandatory institution quarantine and actually that we with the lessons learned through this control efforts that we improved our control measures and the one thing is that man mandatory institutional quarantine that almost all the cases that is identified in the context all the context that we uh, uh, we did the institutional quarantine and also all the repatriates uh, that uh, we started the institutional quarantine uh, for two weeks and this followed with the uh, two more weeks at uh, self quarantine at their own homes so that uh, that prevents any leaking of any undetected cases among these contacts into the society and also that uh, we treat all the patients in ward not at home any case so that also prevented any spreading of uh, cases uh, among these contacts we did all this with only pcr testing uh, just about uh, about 140000 actually with the we have to do some targeted testing because the use of limited resources for the maximum benefit we had the limited resources in the human resources lab capacity as a well less funding anyway that with all these experiences that i can say that that we could by now up to now the 19 uh, problem uh, in the country the future challenges will be the new normal life especially in the transport when the schools open although that the children are at less vulnerable to the disease the problem is with the sport planning of the school that uh, most of the people will be get activated that people that uh, movements will be increased especially elderly people also will be Uh, that who are that taking care of the children will be in the society in the uh, community uh, activating and also uh, the opening of ports of entry that we have to do some day that with that how that we face the this challenge and also the with this uh, becoming new normal and the less reporting of the cases the people's interest public interest will be losing and also from all the sectors especially uh, economic sector and also from the small especially from the small scale industries as well as this uh, uh, self uh, employees uh, there will be a very large pressure on the uh, this uh, the, with the change in priorities uh, to how to that activate their economic uh, activities with all these things that we have to take this challenge and move forward to uh, keep this control as it is until a new vaccination is uh, new vaccine is that uh, the identified and it is been uh, given to the, all the people in the country or that this pandemic is controlled all over the world so that i think that the uh, whole government effort and the whole societal effort is necessary as well as that uh, uh, in the uh, in the country uh, cooperation is also very much important in this aspect thank you very much thank you very much dr samravira for your update and uh, uh, current situation in the country and your future uh, plans to control this uh, pandemic uh let's start the the webinar proper and before that i'd like to introduce our two moderators uh today uh, one moderator is professor saroj jayasinghe chair professor of medicine uh, faculty of medicine university of colombo and dr taranga thoradenia senior lecturer faculty of medicine 
uh, University of Colombo, and she's also the Assistant Secretary of Sri Lanka Veterinary Association. Uh, doc, Professor Jaya Singer and uh, Dr. Thora Dedia, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Right. Okay. Right. Uh, so, yeah. uh, now get on to the webinar proper. I've mentioned about the housekeeping. Uh, uh, the outline of the webinar is uh, that we have three segments. First segment, origins of a pandemic. Professor Malik Piris and Professor N.P. Chandra. The second segment is Animal and Human Health or Global Health. We have Professor Michael Wilkes and Dr. B.M.A. Oswin Ferreira to do that segment. After that, we have a short break for discussion. And then we get on to the third segment, which is controlling future pandemics, the One Health approach. And that will consist of three presentations, Dr. Tikri Priyanta Vijay Tilaka, Dr. Ravi Bandara Disanayaka and Dr. Ilan Amira Satarasingh. Finally, we have a panel discussion which is to chart the way forward. So it's my great pleasure now to invite the first speaker who is uh, Professor Malik Piris. All of you know Professor Malik Piris. He's the chair professor, Department of Microbiology, University of Hong Kong, Faculty of Medicine, and he is uh, Honorary, honorary consultant microbiologist, Queen Mary Hospital and scientific director, HKU Pasture Research Center in Hong Kong. Uh, Professor Piris received his uh, undergraduate training at the University of Peravenia, Sri Lanka. And his postgraduate training in virology was in UK. And in 2003, he played a key role in the discovery of a novel coronavirus which caused SARS severe acute respiratory distress syndrome, respiratory syndrome, and in understanding the pathogenesis of this new disease. He will speak to us on pandemics, why animals, people, and the environment should have been considered. What went wrong? Over to you, Professor Malik Piris. Thank you. Hello, can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir, we can hear you. Yeah, okay. Uh, so thank you for inviting me to take part in this um, um, uh, webinar. And uh, congratulations to the SLMA and uh, SLBA for, for this joint meeting. I think uh, I understand it's the first one, but I hope it's not the last one because I think this uh, One Health collaboration is so important. Uh, so if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, when we think about how epidemics emerge, whether it be in animals or in humans, um, uh, of course, so some of these uh, infections are known infections which can cause epidemics, but what we are talking about really are completely new and unexpected epidemics and pandemics. And in that situation, most often it comes uh, from wildlife uh, to animals causing epidemics or uh, these viruses, because most of the time these are viruses, uh, crossing from uh, wildlife or uh, domesticated animals to humans. And what you see there is that uh, over the last many years, we have had examples of this, uh, such as avian flu, H5N1. Uh, we have had MERS in the Middle East coming from camels to humans, uh, Nipah, Ebola, etc. But those particular zoonotic uh, transmissions were self-limited to some extent. It did not transmit in humans, uh, human to human in an uncontrolled fashion, but occasionally these infections can adapt to transmit efficiently in humans. And uh, that is what happens in the influenza pandemic in 2009, 
uh, the SARS outbreak in 2003 ultimately was brought under control. But of course, right now we have the example of COVID-19, uh, which is now spreading out of control globally. Now, uh, what is important also is to realize that most of the common epidemic diseases in humans we talk about today, I mean, the common things such as measles uh, in the past, smallpox, etc., also came from animals going back uh, some thousands of years. Now, these human epidemics, uh, new ones originate from animals, but often they go back from humans to animals as well. So, for example, if you think about the 2009 uh, swine flu pandemic, uh, as the pandemic spread in humans across the world, it went back from humans back to pigs. And that has happened across the world as well. Um, and this has also happened in the case of COVID-19. So we know that, uh, for example, pet animals uh, can get infected, although they are not really responsible for transmission uh, to other pets or to humans. But there's also transmission to other uh, farmed animals, such as mink in the Netherlands and in Spain. And that has given rise to some human infection as well. Next slide, please. So um, how, before we talk about COVID-19, um, how did SARS emerge? Because COVID-19 virus is very closely related to the SARS virus. And uh, what you can see there is that uh, SARS was a new coronavirus. Um, and uh, uh, it became quite clear that the source of the virus jumping from uh, two humans occurred in these game animal markets. So in Southern China, there is a, uh, there is a demand for wild animal meat and to serve that demand, there is a huge industry that has uh, sprung up, basically um, uh, collecting game wild animals in, in with thousands and thousands of animals, and that allows uh, transmission of viruses from one to another. So that was the place where the jump from animals to humans took place. But then further work showed that the natural reservoir of the 2003 SARS virus was in bats, these small insectivorous bats that you see on the top uh, left-hand corner there. And the next slide. So what about uh, COVID-19, which as you know, is called SARS coronavirus 2 because it's so closely related. Now, when the sequence of that virus became uh, available, it was quite clear that that also was very closely related to this family of SARS-like uh, bat coronaviruses. So, uh, there are very closely related viruses to COVID-19 in bats. But what we do not know is exactly how that infection jumped to humans, whether it also came through these game animal markets as was initially suspected, or whether it came directly from bats to humans. Um, and uh, unfortunately, the investigation in that uh, suspected uh, market in, in Wuhan was not conducted in a proper way, including the veterinary sector. So in other words, it was not a good One Health investigation. So that is why we still do not have a clear idea as to whether that particular market played a role at all in this jump uh, uh, from animals to humans. The next slide, please. Right, so what uh, could have been done to be better prepared? So after SARS, there was a, a lot of effort uh, to make vaccines and antivirals, but of course, with the control of SARS, the funding and the interest died away. Uh, so really, uh, the, the advances that could have been made to help us better prepared for this outbreak were not made. Another big problem, of course, is that the current model for vaccine and, and drug development relies on private pharmaceutical industry, and you really cannot expect uh, the private sector to contribute to developing vaccines for unknown infections, which will, nev which will never become a big problem because the, it's uncertain whether there will be a market for these products. For example, a, a SARS vaccine back in 2003, uh, there may not have been a market. Uh, so we really need new models uh, of uh, developing countermeasures for these emerging infections. The impact of these severe pandemics have been grossly underestimated now, of course, we can see that trillions of uh, US dollars are wiped off uh, global, um, uh, the global economy. Uh, 
the international health regulations, of course, has been a, a partial success, but not fully uh, successfully implemented. And uh, um, um, the, the, the One Health uh, efforts between OIE, FA, and, and uh, the WHO has been successful. The game animal markets, which were identified in 2003, uh, if they had been effectively closed, we probably would not have had this reemergence. Um, and um, and I think the next slide, please. So you can see that many of the things that uh, we could have done to be better prepared require a One Health approach, meaning uh, the, the efforts of not just the human health sector, but also the animal health sector in order to respond better uh, to these types of issues and, and to prepare better for these types of issues. The next slide. So uh, what is One Health? Uh, there are a number of different uh, explanations and definitions for this, but this is one that I like. And the definition is the collaborative efforts of multiple disciplines working locally, nationally, and globally to attain optimal health for animals, people, and the environment. Uh, so it is uh, highlighting the fact that we really have to work together uh, to address some of these global pro problems. And of course, it's not just animal health and human health. We also need behavioral sciences, sociology, anthropology, uh, communication, all these in order to address the challenges that we face. The next slide. Um, and this, uh, this cartoon uh, on the left-hand side essentially illustrates what, what happens in uh, these spillover events from animals to humans. Many of these uh, viruses are in wild animals. They may spill over to domestic livestock, may or may not cause disease in these domestic livestock, uh, and then finally spill over to humans. So surveillance in humans as well as animals is important. Risk assessment of what we find in, uh, in animals is important and, and with influenza that has made some progress, uh, but for other viruses uh, and pathogens, we really have not made as much progress as we can. And then uh, containment at source uh, is something that can be done. I will explain it in the next slide. And of course, early detection of the outbreak in humans uh, or animals can lead to suppression of the spread of that outbreak. And the next slide. So when I talk about containment at source, this is just an example of uh, what was done in Hong Kong about the avian flu uh, uh, transmissions, which uh, of course comes from live poultry to humans and the live poultry markets, <coughs> which are common in Southern China are a source of human infection. But as you can see, although I don't have time to go into detail, but uh, even without closing these live uh, poultry markets, uh, interventions that, uh, that we took have been able to completely reduce and suppress uh, virus transmission and activity in these markets. So by understanding the mechanisms and the drivers of uh, virus transmission, you can take interventions which can be quite simple, which can reduce the risk of uh, amplification and transmission to humans. And then the last slide, next slide. Uh, sorry, we can go on to the next slide because I'm running short of time. Yeah. So. I think uh, most of these events really are quite complex. Uh, we just think of uh, humans and the microbe, the bacterium or whatever it is, but this is, it is not, uh, not so simple. I mean, there are many issues, whether it be ecological factors, uh, genetic biological factors, uh, social, political, economic factors, physical environmental factors, all that play uh, in uh, in generating and spreading these uh, uh, these problems, and today, of course, we are talking about COVID nineteen, but I think this multidisciplinary approach is important, even more important, in even the bigger challenges we face in regard to climate change, uh, environmental pollution, uh, the degradation of biodiversity, and in planetary health overall. So with I will end and uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Malik Peris. 
uh, we will straight away move to the next presentation and then we will have the discussion at the end. Uh, so I'm happy to in, uh, invite and introduce Senior Professor uh, Sunil Chandra, who is a veterinarian and he's uh, currently a Senior Professor and Chair of Medical Microbiology, Faculty of Medicine, University of Colombo Calania, sorry, University of Calania. Uh, he's the Chairman, Research Council of University of Calania. Uh, he was involved in research on One Health approach to emerging zoonotic infections, uh, which was funded by the Swedish Research Council. Uh, and the topic of his presentation today will mainly focus on other coronaviruses in animal and past experiences. Over to you, Prof. Sunil. Good morning to all of you. Uh, thank you for your kind introduction. So I'm talking about uh, other coronaviruses. Uh, first of all, I will also give some introduction. Can I have the next slide? Uh, I'm going to talk first about origin of viruses uh, because viruses appeared when living cells evolved, possibly even before and then subsequently multicellular forms of life and mammals. At some point, these viral genomes established and next millions of years, viruses were evolved. So therefore, viruses were present on the globe before humans. So we can straight away say humans then acquired virus infections from animals. So the infection transmitted from animals to humans is we call zoonosis. Can I have the next slide, please? Yeah, coronaviruses in general, they are common in animals, domestic animals or wild animals, as well as zoo animals. And it's very common in mammals and birds. And the coronaviruses are not always associated with disease. And there are a lot of asymptomatic carriers in many wild animal species. Next slide, please. Okay, I'm just going to history a little bit because it's so important. The earliest description of coronaviruses in 1931 was a new respiratory disease in chicken. Chicken had various respiratory disease, but this was different. That was, uh, they named avian infectious bronchitis. Even today, it is a problem. In 1937, it was isolated in the laboratory. And in 46, there's another infection of coronavirus we call transmissible gastroenteritis in pigs reported. And this is another devastating disease, uh, highly infectious uh, gastroenteritis in swine industry. In 51, murine hepatitis virus was recognized. It's very important to understand about coronavirus uh, pathogenesis as well as various other aspects of the virus. So those experiments done long time ago are still useful even for today's COVID-19 uh, pandemic research. Human coronaviruses were first discovered in 1965 and in 66 also several strains were discovered from medical students with calls. Next slide please. The coronaviruses, uh, there are classified into four major groups, alpha coronaviruses, uh, mainly found in bats and also in feline coronavirus in cats and as well as canine coronaviruses and human coronavirus uh, 229E. Beta coronavirus group representing mammals, carnivores to ruminants and hedgehog to bats. And also the new coronavirus, emerging, emerged coronaviruses, MERS, 
coronavirus, SARS coronavirus one and two, and also human coronavirus zero, uh, OC43 also belongs to this group. And uh, there are gamma coronaviruses uh, from uh, dolphins to whales, and also delta coronavirus you found uh, as another group, mainly in the avian species. Can I have the next one, please? What kind of disease does coronavirus provoke in animals? After the first year of life, more than 80% of domestic species, including cats, cattle, and pigs, are seropositive to at least one coronavirus. Coronaviruses are able to infect several categories of somatic cells, uh, mainly epithelial cells in the digestive mucosa as well as respiratory tract. So the tropism, because of the tropism, the clinical syndromes mainly, there are two, diarrhea and intestinal disorders, especially you see in cows, and respiratory syndromes uh, from upper respiratory tract like common cold to bronchopneumonia. Next slide, please. Could these coronaviruses transmitted to animals to humans? I think uh, Professor Malik Peer is uh, explain all about. Uh, there are few described coronaviruses, SARS, MERS, and SLS, bovine coronavirus, can transmit to other species, like cattle, wild ruminants, camelids, dogs. So there's a wide host range. Generally, coronaviruses are rather species adapted and transmission to another species is rare. However, this transmission is not necessarily being the disease. Uh, usually subclinical disease occur in most cases. But in COVID-19, transmission from animals to humans, there's clinical disease. But again, we know there are asymptomatic infections. Next slide, please. Now, uh, I'll try to say something about mutations and recombinations of coronaviruses. These viruses generally lack the regulation mechanisms to avoid uh, fix, uh, you know, the changes or fixing. Therefore, the mutation rates are large in these viruses. And also because it's RNA virus, the mutation rate, rates are higher than DNA viruses. So the likelihood of uh, copy incidents are very high because the virus, our coronavirus genome is larger than other RNA viruses. In addition, uh, these viruses have the recombination ability uh, is high. It's as high as 25%. So coupled with their mutation rates and the recombination ability, the adaptation of the viruses from animals to humans can occur. Next slide, please. These are some experiences uh, with the animal coronaviruses with regard to mutations and recombinations. Murine hepatitis virus, uh, the deletion mutation of the S gene results in altered biological uh, characteristics of the virus infection. Similarly, RNA recombinants uh, first isolated in mutants of murine herpes or murine hepatitis virus. So these recombinations uh, in tissue culture, experimental animals, as well as in natural infections can occur. Very interesting, uh, striking example in infection in pigs by transmissible gastroenteritis virus. Uh, there was in 1980s, there was a new coronavirus emerging swine industry, pigs. That is, uh, later they realize uh, this porcine coronavirus, respiratory coronavirus has derived from the transmissible gastroenteritis virus with a large deletion in the SG, glycoprotein gene. So this is uh, kind, uh, kind of uh, characteristic of coronaviruses. So this, this has happened in swine industry in 1980s with the devastating disease in 
of respiratory illness, which is derived from the uh, gastroenteritis virus. Similarly, in uh, poultry with the infectious bronchitis virus, the past research show there is natural recombination between wild types. So this also suggests today's uh, COVID-19 outbreak, there are a lot of uh, variations of the strains circulating. Next slide, please. So if I say to which animal species sars cov two is associated uh, with the research in uh, countries involved with this work, they found uh, sars cov two is 96% genomic identity to the bat coronavirus found in horseshoe bats. Uh, and also uh, the specially domain of the virus uh, uh, that uh, it binds with the ACE2 receptor. There is a difference uh, with the bat strain, but it is very close to pangolin strain. So it looks like there's a recombination between these two and as some researchers have suggested. So that even sars coronavirus 2 as uh, Professor Peel said, it started probably in the uh, animal reservoir and the virus have adapted first before coming to the first human case. Next one, please. Now I'm uh, going to touch something about emerging viruses. The term emerging virus uh, was created by scientists uh, in 1990s with, uh, and defined as a new or previously unrecognized infection. Right? But this term implies emerging viruses are new. But this is, uh, uh, I think it is incorrect because new virus infections have been emerging for thousands of years, at least for last 11,000 years at the rise of agriculture. So it's unlikely that new viruses emerge freshly, rather they evolve from existing viruses. So it is safe to say that all human viruses that exist today are zoonotic infections. Next slide. This is uh, some examples uh, which I think Professor Peeves also mentioned. Uh, if you look at uh, genomes of today's members of herpes viruses, the virologists have found the viruses arose 80, 180 to 220 million years ago. It's possibly from similar viruses infecting oysters and fish. Even smallpox emerge after an infection of humans with uh, uh, the bill fox virus, a rod African rodent fox virus. So it's uh, speculated the virus evolved at least 10,000 years ago. Similarly, measles virus, very important. It has been uh, originated probably in humans uh, from cows, because today the cows got the virus called rinderpest is very closely related. Related. So it's believed at least 5,000 years ago, the virus would have jumped to humans from cows because the people started adapting or domesticating cows. Next slide, please. So when we look at these uh, examples, some cases still, although the, the cows transmitted uh, rinderpest to humans and became measles, but still measles, rinderpest, infect simultaneously uh, to animals. But interestingly, polio virus, we don't find any human animal counterpart or uh, there are no ho other hosts, but still we believe the Picona virus family, uh, the polio virus belongs, uh, infecting variety of animals. So the ancient ver versions of these viruses would have jumped to humans uh, and turn into polio. Next slide, please. So I'll talk a little bit about this zoonotic pool some uh, scientists uh, characterize uh, because these new virus infections continue to emerge. It is assumed at least 1 million vertebrate viruses 
on Earth. We only identified about 2,000 viruses. So about 99.8 vertebrate viruses are yet to be discovered. So in other words, zoonotic pool is very large, providing many opportunities for new human infections. Next. The pathogenic potential of this zoonotic pool is very high. There are many human viral diseases that have crossed from other animal species, such as AIDS, Ebola, SARS, encephalitis, and respiratory disease caused by uh, Nipah uh, viruses. Next, please. The emergence, the scientific basis, uh, about you find 75% of emerging pathogens originate in animals. The factors responsible for virus to jump to a, from animals, uh, from animals, mainly ecological and viral characteristics important. The human animal interface has been altered in recent decades due to population growth, environmental disruption, and also rising industrial agriculture. So this interface change has led to this emergence of viruses like Ebola, avian and swine influenza, and several coronaviruses. Next. So I'm going to talk something about which we also should concern, the reverse zoonosis or zoo anthroponosis, uh, human to animal disease transmission. In, in a recent study, uh, it has been found about 38% bacterial, 29% viral, and some parasitic and fungal infections have come to animals from humans. So affected animals are mainly wildlife, livestock, companion animals, and various other animals. Next. So human viruses can jump into animals and that probably see huge epidemics. That's something we should concern because these microbes, uh, they do not cross species uh, just in one direction. It can come back to the animals as well. So, and also human biological threats to animals are rarely reported. So there's a lot of uh, research and surveillance is important. So reverse zoonosis even may foster right conditions for future COVID-19 outbreaks. And recent uh, research or, or information from various countries, we find COVID-19 patients in pet dogs and cats, and also a tiger and seven other big cats in Bronx Zoo in the US. So, the, so there is, however, currently there's no evidence that cats can transmit the virus back to humans. Next. So it is so important, the conservation medicine and One Health, these relationships uh, at the interface of humans, animals, and ecosystems. Uh, Sri Lanka is located in a uh, biodiversity hotspot. Uh, so it is important that we should, because we may have threats because of the, uh, we have very uh, rich wildlife flora and fauna. Next. So finally, I would uh, like to conclude the ecosystem, the environment. Next. Next, please. Animal health, wild dogs, domestic animal or human health, very important. They are all interlinked and it's very important for preventing emerging infections. So therefore, multidisciplinary approach such as One Health is very needed uh, to mitigate the effects of emerging infections. Thank you very much for your listening. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sunil Chandra for that excellent uh, comprehensive presentation. Now we get on to the next speaker. Uh, that's uh, Professor Michael Wilkes, who is joining us from the US and uh, it's quite late in the night for him. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Wilkes for
contributing to this session. Uh, he is the professor of general medicine, geriatrics and bioethics in the University of California and the director of global health. A physician and a social epidemiologist, he is widely known for his creative efforts to introduce medical students to the humanistic side of being a physician. He has led the way towards innovative changes in medical education and One Health at Davis, across the University of California system and in nations around the world, including Sri Lanka. Uh, his focus is going to be on One Health, improving global health. Over to you, Professor Wilkes. Uh, thank you uh, very much. Uh, just uh, by way of testing, uh, are you able to hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you very Excellent. much. Yes. Oh, uh, it, it is a pleasure to join you this morning. Um, I hope uh, in the next 10 minutes to to sort of uh, augment what you've already heard and uh, perhaps um, uh, give it some practical implications. Again, I'd like to congratulate um, all of you on attending this first joint meeting of the Sri Lanka Medical Association and the Sri Lankan uh, um, Veterinary Association. And I hope that there are many, many meetings and discussions uh, and joint approaches that I think will bear huge fruit in terms of addressing uh, Sri Lanka's uh, health problems. Um, as I'm about to point out, I think the future um, uh, in many parts of the health sector will depend on, on interdisciplinary collaboration and problem solving. Um, uh, next slide, please. It wasn't uh, terribly long ago uh, when a, a doctor went to medical school and uh, was taught about the diseases that would affect uh, one or two or 10 or 20 patients. The doctor sits across from a patient and examines the patient and takes a history from the patient. But as we began to learn more about what was happening and began to build an evidence base, we, we, we recognized that while we still, ha still had to attend to the patient who was sitting in front of us, that one patient belonged to a population, uh, sometimes a species, and they lived in an environment. And without an appreciation uh, of that, it was very difficult for us to take care of our patients. Next slide. So that we recognized that as a part of our education uh, that we were providing to medical students and nursing students and dental students and veterinary students, it was really silly to focus just on animals or just on humans or just on the ecosystem. Uh, we know that there are lots of diseases, next slide, that uh, affect us in many different ways. So that we've got a uh, polio and hepatitis A, and we know that pesticides can cause all kinds of toxic exposures for animals and humans. We know that overcrowding has an impact on, on both animals and humans. As people migrate um, because of wars, because of conflicts, uh, they often uh, trap uh, not only themselves and create adverse health experiences, but also our uh, animal friends. And uh, of course, we have uh, issues around pollution. Next slide. I, I don't think uh, in Sri Lanka or in uh, California or in London or in Africa, it, it's a huge step for all of us to buy into the fact that, that a human health is impacted by an enormous a variety of external factors. Yes, uh, it's important that we keep uh, somebody from getting COVID and we wear masks and we socially isolate. But if we ignore some of the social equities in society uh, and inequalities, we, we, we ignore uh, institutional uh, in, inequities um, around how uh, governments spend money. If we look uh, or don't look at, ad, uh, at uh, living situations, including the physical uh, environment and social social environment and um, service environment, and we ignore the risk factors that people have. You know, again, we, we talk with COVID about how important it is to protect yourself, but if you're a single parent and are trying to take care of your child and you have to go to work because you can't feed your children at the end of the day without your salary, it, it is a little bit uh, fruitless for us to say that you need to socially isolate. 
Uh, there are issues around disease, uh, injury, and of course, uh, ultimately, uh, mortality. We, we talk, next slide, about the environmental geographic map. And just by way of background, you know, we have family issues, um, and we know that families are, uh, are hugely impacted by where they live. Uh, in Sri Lanka, they might have poor well water, they might have poor animal protection, stray dogs are going around uh, the village, et cetera. At a, a higher level, the local level, th there, there's often lead, there's standing water that can lead to uh, mosquitoes uh, breeding, there are chemical spills, there are animal management issues, and at least in one area of uh, Sri Lanka, there's the, the problem of CKDU, which while it's not yet settled, is very likely to have uh, some large environmental component. As we move up to the region, uh, smogs and floods and droughts and soil salinity and conflict between different groups of people and the clearing of agricultural land for development all impact not only ha humans, but also animals. And lastly, wh what's happening to our world as we look at climate change and greenhouse gases can be profound. Uh, next slide, The Lancet, um, one of the leading medical journals uh, in the world for the veterinarians. Uh, this is a journal that's published by Elsevier out of London. Uh, the uh, title, uh, Climate Change is the Biggest Global Health Threat of the 21st Century. And lots and lots that we could talk about with regard to uh, uh, global climate change. Next slide, suffice it uh, to say, let me just pick on one particular topic, which is uh, temperature uh, increase. And you can see from the brown graph that, you know, you've all uh, studied this and learned about this. You uh, live on an island where the water is, uh, is rising. Um, and this is going to have a profound effect, not only on people that live near the shore, but on animals, on sea creatures, um, on uh, the, uh, the weather and precipitation, uh, et cetera. So if we look at the next slide, uh, this outlines the impact of climate change uh, on human health. And uh, again, this is not going to be a shock uh, to any of you in the audience, but we, we've got all of these different effects. And they're not effects that impact just humans or just animals. Uh, they impact a huge variety. And as we've just heard about COVID and SARS viruses, you know, it, it's not just the host uh, that's receptive to a new virus, but it is the environment, as uh, Dr. Pires pointed out, that can contribute to spreading uh, the viruses from place uh, to place. So if we look at the next slide, um, this is, uh, uh, been alluded to by um, by uh, Dr. Pierce, but th this one health concept, you know, we often think of it as as zoonosis, and zoonosis is a very important part of it. But it is a whole host of activities um, that uh, go, come together, and. I ask you to think about your own training as a veterinarian, uh, as a nurse, as a physician, and how much of this did you really learn uh, about when you were in um, uh, health sciences school? Uh, next slide, um, you've seen a little bit of this, but uh, if you hit the next slide button, um, you, you'll see that we've got um, all these different specialties that Dr. Pierce related to. You know, we as doctors and as veterinarians don't need to be an expert in each of these, but we do need to have some basic understanding so that we can talk with those experts. And every one of these areas belongs in our vet school or our medical school curriculum. Um, uh, the uh, um, next slide. Um, so the who, um, who, who is going to carry the mantle for One Health? Next slide. It, it's going to be all the specialists that Dr. Pierce talked about, um, you know, and, and then some. I perhaps forgot some on this slide, but it, it is every one of these specialists that need to deal with some of the wicked problems that are facing Sri Lanka and Southeast Asia and the rest of the world. Um, so if we go uh, to the next slide, um, 
it, it is uh, this idea of how are we going to solve this? And it, it isn't going to be easy. And I, I want to, as, a, as an educator, try to address this from an educational perspective. And, and it is that we have trained for too long our health science professionals in these silos where the doctors learned by themselves and the veterinary medicine folks learned by themselves and agriculture and dentistry and nursing and psychology. And, and there are some things that they need to learn by themselves. But those of you who are listening to this who come primarily from medicine and veterinary medicine um, would be shocked to look at how much overlap there is in the curriculum between medicine and veterinary medicine. And when we look at how can we train around One Health issues, there are a whole bunch of areas that we can do that are what I would call low lying fruit. None of these require huge amounts of money. They don't involve programming. They don't involve building new buildings. But we can create case uh, discussions in small groups where we actually put veterinary medical students and human medical students in the small groups together to solve problems. This can be done in the old days, meaning like six months ago, you could do this in person. But even today, you can do it virtually where you've got medical students, say, perhaps in Colombo and veterinary students, perhaps in, in Peridinia, who can be together for an afternoon focused on a problem. You can put faculty together and help develop them so that they uh, can work collaboratively across disciplines. You, you can take the students and send them out into the community to focus uh, on research questions. So let's just say, for example, you wanted to look at CKDU. What an innovative way to uh, look at how this problem is affecting One Health other than to have the veterinarians um, and the human researchers and the anthropologists go out in a pod or a group to do house-to-house -house surveys. You can have the, the disciplines work on developing policy initiatives for the government that address One Health things. And lastly, perhaps a little bit more ambitious, perhaps a little bit more money required, but you could develop new joint degrees. For example, a master's degree in One Health. So I, I think uh, in closing, I, I want to just challenge you to think uh, broadly and to recognize that this concept of One Health is not something that's in vogue this month or this year. You know, SARS and COVID-19 uh, haven't brought this about. This is a fundamental change in how we think about disease, uh, interrelationships, and how we're going to keep our planet and the living things on our planet healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wilkes, for that excellent presentation. And uh, it's a real eye-opener, I think. Without much ado, I'll move to the next presentation. Now, uh, Dr. Michael, uh, Professor Michael uh, told us about uh, how we have been learning in silos for too long. So, uh, Professor Oswin Pereira will uh, uh, highlight and emphasize more on the need to establish a system for surveillance on zoonotic wildlife diseases through interinstitutional collaboration. Uh, Dr. Pereira is a visiting professor at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Science, University of Peradeniya, and the director of the Sri Lanka Wildlife Health Center. He was the project leader for a recently completed project on building research excellence in wildlife and human health in Sri Lanka, which was funded by the International Development Research Center of Canada. Uh, and uh, this was based on the One Health approach and involving several partner institutions in Sri Lanka and Canada. Over to you, sir. Okay. Hello, good morning. Can you hear me? 
Yes, sir, we can hear. Hello. Hello. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for this invitation. Right. Now, what I'm going to speak is on three aspects, um, mainly the importance of eco health, which has been referred to by all three speakers before One Health and Eco Health, then the need for surveillance on zoonotic wildlife diseases, and the importance of interinstitutional collaboration. Next slide, please. Okay, as has been mentioned, ecosystems are very important and they are consist of animals and they provide biodiversity. They are the Earth's natural assets. And of course, we need to have a healthy balance between these different components. So eco health requires biodiversity of plants and animals. And wild animals and domestic animals provide what is called ecosystem services or benefits to the environment, to themselves and to us. But the problem is when they are out of balance, they have negative effects and then that's when we have various risks. The next slide, please. Yes, now, as was also mentioned, we have One Health and Eco Health. Originally, the One Health triad had wildlife, human and domestic animal diseases. But now, as was mentioned by all three speakers, the One Health triad also involves having a healthy environment. So Eco Health actually, as Professor Wilkes mentioned, brings together a range of specialists, not only in the medical and veterinary fields, but ecological, economies, planners, etc. The idea is to prevent, detect and respond to and recover from biological threats. Next slide, please. Now, as you can see here, and also as mentioned before, a loss of forests, uh, intensification of agriculture, movement of animals, aggregation of animals in live markets, in wet markets, etc. These are some of the drivers for the problems that we are seeing. And pathogens and vectors, they mutate, they evolve, they develop resistance, and then they pro proliferate. So these where we have emerging infection diseases. Yes, this uh, figure here shows wildlife emerging infections diseases, domestic animal EIDs, and human EIDs. And of course, the whole host of factors related to the environment and the others as mentioned, which promote this type of emergence. Next slide, please. I'll just give one example of the Nipah virus, which emerged in 1998. Now, forest uh, fruit bats migrated to cultivated orchards, orchards in Malaysia due to a change in climate, the El Nino at that time, the drought. And they came into these uh, farms, pig farms, transmitted this virus to pigs, and this was then transmitted to humans and caused very high mortality in pigs as well as humans. Next one, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, as uh, Dr. Taranga also wanted me to mention about Lisa viruses. No, not that one. Previous one, please. Previous one? Yeah, okay. Lisa viruses, which are rhabdovirus family. And there are many major species, as I have listed here. And they transmit rabies as well as bat Lisa viruses. Okay. And Recently, a novel Lisa virus was discovered in Sri Lanka through the project that we conducted, which I will mention later. Next, please. Uh, here I have listed some of the important zoonoses, viral and bacterial in Sri Lanka, rabies and Japanese encephalitis. And the ones in blue are the hosts that are domestic animals, and the ones in red are the hosts that are uh, wild animals, and those can be transmitted between wild animals and domestic animals, as well as humans. And some of the bacterial diseases, again, uh, the domestic animals and the wild animals that transmit these. Next one, please. Uh, these are some of the domestic, uh, wild animals in which rabies has been diagnosed, both at the MRI and the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine Diagnostic Centers. So as you can see, a whole host of wild animals do get rabies and then they can transmit these to domestic animals as well as to humans. Next one, please. There are also a few zoonoses of bacterial foodborne origin and of parasitic origin as shown here, 
And for example, leishmaniosis is also transmitted from wild animals such as jar, chacol, giant squirrel, and palm sewer. Next one, please. Okay, now with regard to biodiversity, now Sri Lanka is considered a hotspot for biodiversity. And as we all know, unfortunately, our forest cover has been declining drastically. Uh, at the moment, we have less than 19% of the country in forest. And in the country, there are only about 13% of forests that are under protected areas. So rural communities that live around wildlife life habitats, their main livelihood is crops and livestock. And there's an intensifying interface between wildlife, domestic animals, and humans. And as we all know, this has given rise to the intensifying human animal conflicts, which we hear about every day. So my focus in this presentation is the need for strengthening wildlife disease surveillance, which I deal with in the following slides. Next, please. Next slide. Yeah, some, there have been some initiatives and programs in Sri Lanka. For example, previously there was a HPAI program, uh, DAPH and partners, Dr. Tikiri who is here, is well aware of this. There was a lot of field activities and capacity building. There's also ongoing surveillance programs by DAPH for a whole range of uh, domestic animal diseases. There's a rabies control joint national committee, antimicrobial resistance national committee, and what I want to talk about is the Sri Lanka Wildlife Health Center, which we have been trying to uh, establish and develop. Next one, please. Yes, now this was a virtual center for international cooperation, which was established through a letter of agreement in 2011 between four different institutes, Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Science, Department of Animal Production and Health, Department of Wildlife Conservation, and Ministry of Health. Now, I have given here the ministries that these belong to. As you can see, they have changed a lot from the original. There have been various combinations, permutations, and changes. But the departments have stayed the same, fortunately. And I will go into some of the problems that we have as, had as well in continuing with these activities. Next one, please. Now the concept was that we would have a board of management with directors general of these four institutes with possible future partners of other institutes. And there's an honorary director and a technical committee nominated by partner institutes. Now this institute or this center does not have legal authority of its own or any funding of its own. It operates under the authority of the four government departments or institutes which it serves. Next one, please. The main objective is to coordinate the operation of a national wildlife health program in Sri Lanka, to establish a surveillance system for wildlife diseases, for diagnosing, reporting, etc., to manage diseases that occur, and to prevent new diseases occurring. The idea is to reduce the risks of interspecies transmission of pathogens, including those are the communicable to humans and domestic animals. Next, please. And fortunately, we were able to get funding from Canada. We wrote up a project and we got funding from 2013 to 2017 to have a project on creating a network for research and co-management at the Wildlife Human Health Interface. This was awarded to the University of Peradeniya with partners uh, as the collaborators of the Sri Lanka Wildlife Health Center and the University of Saskatchewan. The, Objective was to identify the knowledge, beliefs, and perceptions of local communities and other stakeholders, and to conduct research capacity building in laboratories and training for professional and support staff, and to develop a mechanism for sharing of information and networking. Next, please. So we initially studied five different wildlife uh, habitats around uh, national parks, Vasgamua, Madurai, Horton Plains, Udawalave, and Bundala. Next, please. And we had workshops with uh, local communities using participatory rural appraisal. Next, please. And we had a questionnaire survey and focus group discussions with farmers, uh, other stakeholders, involving also indigenous communities. Next, please. We had workshops with government officials and field staff 
including veterinary surgeons, uh, public health inspectors, midwives, uh, grama niladaris, etc. in the villages. Next, please. And some of the training activities that we conducted, uh, we had our Canadian partners visiting us here periodically, at least twice a year. And whenever they were here, we took that opportunity to have training workshops, seminars, and other aspects for capacity building and to help our veterinarians, uh, field staff, wildlife department officials, etc. So I'll just go through a few of these uh, slides. Uh, training workshop for veterinarians on pathology, training workshop of field staff of wildlife department. Next, please. Uh, we had necropsies done. We asked the wildlife veterinarians to collect carcasses. We provided them with freezers under the project. And then when our experts from Canada visited together with our pathologists, we went down there and conducted necropsies on the carcasses that were collected. You can see the range here, uh, including even pythons. Next, please. Next slide. We also had various workshops, both in Peradenia as well as uh, in the field. For example, the workshop on role of wildlife personnel here was conducted in Giritale. The next one. Next slide, please. A training workshop on wildlife disease ecology, again conducted in Peradenia. Workshop on sharing information about wildlife, etc., conducted at Udawalawe. Next one. And uh, we uh, presented uh, one oral presentation and four posters at the One Health Eco Health Congress based on the studies that were done under the project. Our MPhil uh, students who had training in Canada and then came back here to do their field work in Sri Lanka and presented their thesis to the University of Peradenia. Uh, all of them were funded by the project to go and present their work at the Eco Health Congress in Australia in 2016. Next, please. And these are the four projects that were undertaken by IMFU students. Uh, one was on uh, neuropathology in the brains of non-rabid animals submitted for rabies testing in Sri Lanka. This was a student from uh, a veterinarian from the VRI, uh, DAPH. And then one on diseases, lesions, and pathogens of Indian flying foxes from the faculty. This is the project that identified the Lisa virus uh, and it was published as, and it's now called the Ganorua, uh, Ganorua Lisa virus. And we had a workshop at the Ganorua Peradinia Botanical Gardens uh, to uh, have a, uh, to inform the staff there about this finding and to uh, update their knowledge and to make sure that they took necessary precautions when handling flying foxes. The third one was on challenges of wild animal disease surveillance or zoonotic disease control again by a veterinarian from the DWC. And the fourth is translation and mobilization of knowledge among rural communities about FMD, again from a bioveterinarian from the DWC. So we have been trying to build capacity in the DAPH and the DWC through these activities. Then when this project was coming to an end, uh, we developed a follow-up project uh, titled Mitigation of Disease Risks to Livestock and Humans through Targeted Wildlife Disease Surveillance. This was jointly developed by the Technical Committee of the SLWHC and the DAPH Directorate. It was submitted by DAPH to the Ministry of Rural Economic Affairs and it was approved for funding from 2018. Next, please. So some activities are going on. However, we have had several issues and bottlenecks. Main administrative bottlenecks have been the frequent changes in the ministries and the responsibilities and priorities of these ministries. Also frequent changes in the directors general and the heads. Uh, financial, there is no specific funds allocated by each partner institute. So we can have some progress only when there is funding through a special project. And motivation and support also is also highly variable between participating individuals and institutions. So what is the way forward? What I would like to suggest is that the Sri Lanka Wildlife Health Center is established as an approved center within one of the partner institutes with a defined mandate and a legal framework as well as the financial provisions for institutional collaboration. Next, please. Because what we are trying to establish animal disease surveillance by detection on, down at the field level, diagnosis through improved laboratory facilities and communication right down from the uh, grassroots level to the top management and the uh, 
and the uh, policy level. And I hope that we will be able to achieve some uh, progress in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I hope you all can hear me. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Austin Pereira. Uh, now we come uh, to a short discussion. Uh, we have uh, the panel of speakers, uh, Professor Malik Piris, Professor Sunil Chandra, uh, Professor Michael Wilkes, and Dr. Austin Pereira. We are running behind time, so we can only have uh, five minutes of discussion. So uh, any questions which uh, which any areas which any of the speakers want to clarify? Any areas which you want to clarify? Well, one area which we want to get your ideas also is how to move forwards and uh, in relation to what are the organizational uh, steps the Medical Association and the SLVA should be taking because from the chat box, we understand that there are a lot of activities which have taken place. So any ideas? Professor Wilkes, uh, would you mind starting off, please? It'd be my pleasure. Um, the, um, I, I think that you know, there are, are several steps that can be taken, but perhaps the first and easiest might be to create um, some sort of an opportunity for future members uh, of the two organizations to begin to network and work together. So, you know, perhaps uh, I don't know when the, the meetings for each organization are, but I if there could be a meeting before or after the main meeting that would in include uh, all of the the students who are interested in One Health issues, that might be um, a uh, first step. The other step you, you might do is, is perhaps um, you know, provide a small amount of money or some sort of uh, incentive to the um, medical schools in Sri Lanka uh, to work with the University uh, of Peridania and, and to create uh, perhaps cases that could be shared across all the medical schools. Again, you know, I come from uh, California where we have six uh, University of California Medical Schools, and it, it would shock you how little uh, we work together uh, across medicine. We recruit the same students, we have the same competitiveness, et cetera. But Sri Lanka uh, could learn from that and say that they're not going to be competitive and that when it comes to things like One Health and working with the University of Peridania, um, that uh, you know, schools can, um, can uh, create pieces of curriculum that can be shared across uh, the country with each of the other medical schools. Thank you very much. So uh, two things which, which you suggested, and already we are, we are hoping to have some sort of joint activities with the SLVA. Uh, from the chat box, there's an idea of having a Facebook so, so that people can contr start contributing. And I think uh, there, there are discussions already taking place on how, how the veterinary uh, school can uh, link with the different medical faculties. So thank you very much. Any other comments? from the other speakers, Prof. Malik or Prof. Sunil Chandre, Dr. Oswin Pereira. Uh, so Saroj, I, I strongly second and, and support what Professor Wilkes has said. I mean, I think uh, there are many, many, many places we can start and, and I think we should start in many, many of these uh, uh, levels. But I think uh, the undergraduate education is, is uh, something that is low hanging fruit, as Professor Wilkes said. I mean, I think, of course, the curriculums are crowded in, in, um, in medical schools, in veterinary schools, but the challenges that we globally will have to face in the years ahead are, are, are going to be really, as was mentioned, wicked problems. Wicked problems meaning that no one discipline can address them. So it's really high time that um, our medical veterinary students um, were, were uh, you know, explained that, that we really have to have a multidisciplinary type of framework. So that's one level, but, but at, of course, at the professional level, it would be also great to bring in 
uh, you know, collaborations. I mean, as I have mentioned before, when I talked about it, I was quite fortunate uh, when I was a medical student at that time, the veterinary students and the medical students and the dental students all learned together. Uh, you know, we, we did biochemistry together, physiology together. Um, so that was uh, extremely important for in, in having those relationships uh, in future when um, I had problems, for example, facing epidemics of such as Japanese encephalitis. Over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Malik. Right, so I think we must now move on because uh, for, for want of time. Uh, so thank you very much again, especially to the overseas speakers who have, uh, who have come in uh, despite their busy schedules. We would love to have you uh, linked, but uh, we can certainly allow you to go now. Uh, Professor Michael Wilkes, especially, thank you very much. We know it's quite late in the night. And uh, uh, Professor Malik Piris, thank you once again. And uh, we hope to keep this conversation going. And now I think we must move on to the next, uh, uh, next uh, se session. And I have the pleasure of inviting uh, Dr. Taranga Thoradeniya now to take over that session. Taranga, over to you. Uh Thank you very much. That was a very, very interesting uh, uh, session. And let's move on to the next session, which is controlling future pandemics, the One Health approach. I would uh, like to inv uh, invite and introduce the first speaker, Dr. Tikiri Priyanta Vijay uh, He is an AMR technical officer, World Organization for Animal Health sub-regional representative for Southeast Asia, and he's based in Thailand. He was the regional One Health Specialist for Fleming Fund Management Agent. Uh, and uh, he has worked uh, uh, collaboratively uh, in Sri Lanka and the World Bank project to contribute to the Sri Lanka Avian Influenza Preparedness and Response Project in 2011, which has prevented uh, movement of this infection into Sri Lanka. Uh, so he will be uh, briefing us on the response of the OIE to the COVID-19 emergency. Over to you, Dr. Tikiri. Okay, thank you very much. And indeed, uh, it's a great pleasure to be back, at least virtually in Sri Lanka, <laughs> although the airports are still closed. So uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, today I'm going to explain you very briefly what is OIE and uh, what is the OIE incident management approach and what are the new tools that OIE has developed uh, in the emergence of COVID-19 and what would be the impact of COVID-19 in driving future work programs at the OIE. Uh, maybe we can discuss further in the point five in the discussions. Next, please. Next. Yeah, uh, this uh, diagram will show the I mean, evolution of OIE. Uh, you might see that OIE was established in 1924, uh, jointly by 28 countries, and it was about 28, 21 years before UN was established in 1945. In 2003, uh, OIE actually changed the name of the organization as World Organization for Animal Health, but uh, continue to uh, keep the acronym as OIE, which was the French name, the original name, uh, Office International de Episutis, that was uh, created in 1924. Uh, unlike uh, WHO and FAO, OIE doesn't have country offices. I mean, the headquarters of OIE is based in Paris, and we have five regional representations and seven sub-regional representations. Next, please. Uh, OIE is working uh, with countries through the uh, chief veterinary officers. So OIE delegates at country level represent OIE and at the general assembly represent the country. So that is how it works. So uh, our office, uh, I'm uh, attached to the Bangkok uh, Southeast Asian Regional Office. It is the sub-regional representation for Southeast Asia, ASEAN countries. And I was previously working in regional uh, representation for Asia Pacific, which is based in Tokyo. Actually, it works with all 32 countries. We are working with 
10 countries in ASEAN region. So next, please. So at this moment, actually, why is the World Organization for Animal Health? It means uh, it is the organization responsible for setting up international standards for animal health and welfare. So uh, it is uh, the probably uh, biggest uh, outside UN organization which is working with a large number of countries. And it is the uh, International Referral Organization for Animal Health Standards for World Trade Organization. At the moment, we have 182 countries. Sri Lanka is actually a member uh, since long uh, of, of the World Animal Health Organization. Next, please. Yeah, uh, one of the uh, major disciplines of uh, OI is to provide uh, technical assistance to member countries. So we are working with 254 reference laboratories specialized for different diseases in 37 countries. Uh, and uh, those are specialized for 106 diseases. And uh, also we have 58 collaborating centers. Those are discipline based. Uh, I mean, uh, having in 28 countries with 50 topics. Next. Yeah, uh, this is one of the key areas, uh, thematic areas of this uh, session. So it is One Health. You can see uh, OIE uh, with FAO and WHO first started uh, this One Health activities by agreeing on a common concept in 2010. In 2017, uh, this was further uh, expanded to strengthen the 2010 agreement I mean, initially it was mainly focused on influenza, zoonotic influenza, rabies, and antimicrobial resistance. But uh, in 2017, it was further expanded to cover most of the One Health issues. And in 2018, a memorandum of understanding was signed. Actually, uh, it is not only at the global level, at the regional level also, uh, we have strong uh, tripartite mechanism. Uh, happy to say that uh, Asia Pacific region is one of the most active and most collaborated uh, region uh, under this uh, tripartite agreement. And we are doing a lot of activities. And uh, the recent uh, true uh, One Health activity we are going to start most probably by next year is the multi uh, partner trust fund AMR uh, project. Uh, in this region, actually, two countries were qualified Indonesia and Cambodia. Uh, next, please. Next, <clears throat> next slide, please. Yeah, uh, this is the uh, mechanism that OI introduces in managing this kind of uh, emergency situations. So uh, this is what we call uh, incident management system. So uh, it is a mechanism that includes functions of coordination, command and control for management of emergency events. So uh, at the national level, it is a structure providing interdepartmental or interorganizational interoperability because we have been talking about One Health, scientific aspects of uh, One Health. And uh, it is time for us to discuss about the uh, organizational aspect of uh, One Health, how, how we can put One Health concept into practice. So that is where we are finding it uh, difficult because we are still, I mean, confined into a lot of silos and we have to find the way out of these silos. So this is one mechanism we can develop at country level. So you can see different components, intelligence, planning, operations, logistics, IPM and welfare. Next, please. Next slide, yeah, okay, thanks. Yeah, uh, this is uh, how it operates at uh, OI level. So uh, it is actually led by uh, Deputy Director General International Standards and Science, uh, Dr. Matthew Stone. He is the key person who has the command and control uh, across the organization. So then uh, Director General of OI is the person who will have high level stakeholder management. For example, uh, working with uh, the direct generals of WHO and FAO and maybe big leaders of country level. So director general handles this part. Then engagement with resource partners. You know that uh, we, we need to have resources. We need money. We need technical support. That is handled by the Department of uh, 
uh, engagement and uh, investment. So uh, the communication is one of the critical things. So I is having a lot of communication activities as a single organization as well as with tripartite. Uh, it is being handled by uh, public information and communication department. So uh, down the line, there are other technical divisions of the organizations are linked to this uh, system. So one of the most important uh, division is uh, this preparedness and resilience department. Actually, this uh, division was created in uh, early this year. OI had the long term plan of preparedness and uh, long term plan to uh, extend its uh, I mean, assistance to regional countries through this uh, PNR division. So in addition uh, to this PNR division, uh, OI has recently developed uh, this ad hoc group on COVID-19. Uh, it is to help uh, WHO mainly, plus uh, member states to how to handle this situation uh, jointly. So next, please. Then uh, this is the timeline of OIE's activities uh, took place since the inception of this uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, since January this year. So first of all, uh, uh, it was uh, to support uh, IHR uh, Emergency Committee of WHO on advisory basis, then contribution for WHO R&D roadmap. It is through mainly this uh, ad hoc group on uh, COVID-19. Then uh, in March, uh, initiated concept for reduction of risk spillover events. Uh, I mean, OI has developed guidelines for uh, veterinary laboratories to support public health sector. For example, uh, I mean, I, I will later share you some links with uh, how you can find this information. Most of the animal health laboratories in African region are handling uh, human health samples at this moment to support the public health service for uh, diagnosing COVID-19 because uh, animal health laboratories are equally equipped and uh, with the uh, trained people who can handle these samples uh, with uh, some training and uh, providing adequate biosecurity. They are capable of doing uh, diagnostic activities for public health services. And in addition, in European countries, uh, for example, uh, Italy and uh, Spain, they are also involved in diagnosing samples. In this region, Asian region, Indonesia is uh, supporting the public health service for diagnosis of uh, COVID-19. And in addition, uh, Bhutan and Timor-Leste are supporting uh, health services to manage uh, this uh, uh, movement control and things like that. Then uh, in April, uh, WISE uh, issues a statement with Wildlife Working Group. Then uh, in May, uh, consideration for sampling, testing, uh, of uh, animals. Actually, OI doesn't recommend at this moment for testing, uh, large scale testing of animals, because uh, I mean, it, there are no uh, pro proven, uh, I mean, not yet proven that it is uh, transmitting through animals. So at this moment, OI doesn't recommend any uh, application of any sanitary measures on international trade based on uh, COVID-19 as well. So in this context, actually OI with FAO and WHO developed uh, some infographics also uh, that were shared in last uh, World Food Safety Day. So it is to, uh, I mean, give a good impression for people that food is safe. Uh, that was the uh, theme of that thing. Then a uh, survey of member countries on the emerging disease situation. So uh, we will have a lot more. And one of the activities we recently conducted with the a webinar with the delegates. Uh, next slide, please. Next, next, please. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah this, this one is uh, just, uh, I mean, uh, some examples that I have explained uh, in my previous slide. And Q&A uh, is, uh, I mean, very, very current uh, way of communicating with uh, veterinary services and other public. Uh, I mean, what are, what are the, I mean, uh, things that is going on with animal health sector and what do's and don'ts and also what are the truth and myths and something like that. So you please refer to this. Uh, then we develop some media uh, like videos and statements. Next, please. 
Yeah, uh, these are the guidelines uh, developed by OIE for member countries for veterinary laboratories, then sampling and testing, uh, things like that, and application of sanitary measures. Uh, next, please. Yeah. So this is the future. I mean, uh, with this emergence of this kind of uh, pandemics, global pandemics, uh, it is uh, inevitable that in any uh, global organization, intergovernment organization has to develop some uh, future plans to prevent the next pandemic. So this is uh, the approach of OIE. So actually I was just a uh, few minutes before I was informed that uh, OIE has decided to remove this picture from the website because it shows some wrong uh, mask practice. So not to give a wrong impression. So this will be immediately removed in next few minutes. Uh, this, uh, this is the uh, wildlife management framework uh, to help because OIE uh, understood that it is very difficult to ban this uh, wildlife trade or wet markets or anything like that because in some countries this is livelihood some countries there are approved wildlife sales practices and because of that uh, it is very important to understand what are the practices at country level and how we have to manage uh, to prevent the uh, risk and spillovers that is why this this management framework is going to be developed then uh, the OIE policy paper it will be uh, come out soon and also a review of uh, the activities that we have already done. So uh, next, please. So uh, that's all uh, for the time being. Maybe we can discuss further details in the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tikiri. We'll uh, straight away move to the next presentation as we are running short of time. Uh, the next presenter is Dr. Ravi Bandara Disanayaka. Uh, he is a veterinary epidemiologist at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, that is FAO. Uh, through FAO, he has involved in the first ever regional field epidemiology capacity building program for veterinarians in South Asia. He worked at FAO Rome with global early warning team supporting disease intelligence activity. Uh, presently, he coordinates a global project involved in strengthening capacity of field veterinary epidemiology, risk assessment, and disease informing, information sharing in Africa, Eastern Europe, Central Asia, and Asia Pacific. The main focus of his presentation would be FAO, Veterinary Epidemiology Capacity Development, Early Detection and Rapid Response to Disease Outbreaks. Over to you, Dr. Ravi. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. Uh, can you all hear me? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you very much for, for the introduction. It's uh, great to be invited for this important webinar. I'm really happy to see Sri Lanka is taking steps to operationalize One Health approach. Today I'm going to talk about uh, FAO's uh, global efforts to develop veterinary epidemiology capacities in countries because uh, veterinarians working in the front line or in the field have a major responsibility on disease surveillance and outbreak investigation. Therefore, field epidemiology skills are essential for them. Next slide, please. First, I would like to introduce FAO. As some of you may already know, FAO was established in 1945 as a specialized agency of the United Nations. Currently, there are 194 members, and its headquarters is located in Rome, Italy. Sri Lanka joined FAO as a member nation in 1948, and country office was established in 1979, covering both Sri Lanka and the Maldives. FAO country office is located at Bauda Lokamata, Colombo, which is not very far from WH4 country office. Next slide, please. 
Okay, FAO has five strategic frameworks for eradication of hunger, elimination of poverty, and sustainable management and use of natural resources. Regarding animal health, FAO focuses on several overlapping issues such as zoonotic diseases, transboundary diseases, insect-borne diseases, diseases of production and health, veterinary public health, food safety, strengthening of veterinary systems, antimicrobial resistance, and one health. Here you can see two important areas, antimicrobial resistance and One Health, where multi-sectoral collaboration is needed. Next slide, please. We, we know that we need to take measures to prevent and control diseases at their source. For that, building a skillful workforce in epidemiology in a country is crucial. We know that field epidemiology training programs train epidemiologists to investigate outbreaks and conduct infectious disease surveillance. These programs train in-service health workers employed in public health departments and ministries, mainly the medical staff. However, some of these programs also provide epidemiology training to veterinarians. For example, in Pakistan, Turkey, Jordan, to name a few. FAO has been supporting veterinary epicapacity development in many countries since long time. The first veterinary version of the field epidemiology training, that is a field, that is a version of the field epidemiology training program. That's the medical program and the veterinary version of it is a field epidemiology training program for veterinarians. The first veterinary version was established in Thailand. This was done in partnership with the existing Thailand field epidemiology pro training program and supported by FAO and CDC of the United Nations and the Thai ministries of health and agriculture. Since then, several other countries have also started similar field veterinary epidemiology training programs to train veterinarians in epidemiology, such as China, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Indonesia, and even Bangladesh, where it recently started a two-year field epidemiology training program. To train vets in South Asia, FAO initiated a regional training in 2011. Several Sri Lankan vets participated in this training, and I hope they are still working with the Department of Animal Production and Health and the Veterinary Research Institute. Next slide, please. Okay, so recognizing the importance of field epidemiology training, FAO organized a global workshop on veterinary epidemiology coordination in 2018 at FAO headquarters. More than 80 veterinary experts, veterinary epidemiology experts, attended this meeting representing Asia, Africa, Europe, North America, Central America, and Australia. During this global meeting, participants agreed that FAO takes the lead in developing global guidelines for development of field epidemiology training programs, and also agreed that One Health approach needs to be incorporated as a core competency. Later, mm -hmm. the follow-up workshop was held again in Rome to finalize core competencies and initiate the development of field epidemiology training technical guidelines. For this meeting, 20 international experts participated and the guidelines are being prepared now. Next slide, please. After that global meeting in 2018, FAO has been developing guidelines and core competencies for frontline and intermediate level trainings. We are focusing on two level trainings, that is frontline training and intermediate training at this moment. But the next stage is to go for the advanced level field epidemiology training. And, and these technical guidelines and core competencies is a, is a, like a, a competency, it's a combination of skills, we know that. A combination of skills, knowledge, and attitudes that an animal health worker must achieve to perform their roles in animal health services. A participant successfully completing this program should be able to demonstrate the achievement in all competencies. If you see that uh, here, these core competencies fall under eight domains. Each core competency has several sub-competencies as well. So the eight core competencies are epidemiological surveillance, field disease outbreak investigation and response, epidemiologic methods, communication. Here, communication involves uh, uh, risk communication as well and also preparedness, ethics and professionalism, disease control and prevention, and finally the One Health, which is very important what we are talking today. 
The one year domain includes three core competencies and 11 sub core competencies. One such core competency is to include animal, human, and environmental sectors in disease surveillance, outbreak investigation, preparedness, and response to multifaceted health events. Next slide, please. Okay. Uh, we, we understand that uh, needs and requirements of veterinary services differ between countries. They are at uh, different capacity levels. Therefore, we are very flexible in designing training programs for veterinarians. Before the trainings are conducted or delivered, we basically assess the epidemiology capacity of animal health services of the beneficiary country. Without that, we are not going to deliver a training. This is done to identify gaps and strengths to tailor make the training program to suit the country. How do we do this? We use several tools developed by FAO. Epi capacity is assessed using an epidemiology mapping tool, and the disease surveillance system is assessed by using a surveillance assessment tool. Train and also training need assessment and readiness assessment are also conducted where necessary. So using the EMT, we can assess the capacity, epidemiology capacity at institutional level, human resource level, and individual capacity as well. Okay, this uh, frontline field epidemiology training for veterinarians include one month face-to-face -face training and, and a mentorship period, which lasts for three months. This mentorship period is very important. It is provided, this mentorship is provided in collaboration with the local academic institution, generally a veterinary school. During this mentorship period, trainees are able to put into practice the skills and knowledge gained during the trainings. For the One Health component of the training, we liaise with the WHO experts and experts from the health departments of beneficiary countries. So far, we have received very good response from Turkey, Jordan, and Pakistan regarding the One Health component, and WHO is willing to provide their expertise for, for to, to conduct the, the training and to support the One Health component of the training. Next slide, please. So in addition to field epidemiology trainings, FAO provide specialized training on rapid risk assessment, which is also important to, to assess the risk of diseases coming into a country or to assess the existing disease situation. So these trainings are provided to national level vets in collaboration with FAO reference centers reference centers of epidemiology and other academic institutions at country level. The map shows some of the countries where we conduct epi capacity development programs. So this is not the most updated map and there's a huge uh, epi capacity development program is ongoing in Africa, covering more than 20 countries. But unfortunately, currently Sri Lanka is not included in this uh, capacity development program. Maybe in the future, we can consider including Sri Lanka as well. Next slide, please. Yes, okay. Our effort is to strengthen the field epidemiology capacities in countries with one health approach so that diseases, including zoonosis, can be detected early and controlled effectively at the source, thereby preventing disease outbreaks becoming major epidemics or pandemics. With that note, I conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. Over to you, Taranga. Um, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ravi. Uh, let's move on to the next presentation and then we will have a short discussion. The next speaker is Dr. Dilan Amila Satarasingha. Uh, Dr. Dilan is a senior lecturer at the Faculty of Veterinary Medicine and Animal Science, University of Peradeniya. Uh, he collaboratively works with the animal production industry to strengthen the sustainable production and distribution networks He's currently leading the research funded by the UGC on one health approach for successful contain of COVID-19 with the utilization of genetic tools to trace SARS-CoV-2 transmission. His main focus would be how to use uh, genomic epidemiology mapping for viruses for robust control measures. Over to you, Dylan.
Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Ranga. Hope you all can hear me. Yes, sir. Okay. So, so today I will focus on the molecular electrode tools that we can use, uh, use for a mapping of uh, different quality or organisms and how you can trace those organisms in during a pandemic. So let's look at what is uh, this wellness slide. What is molecular epidemiology? Actually, it is the uh, tool that we use mainly come with uh, molecular biological uh, uh, tools and we incorporate into the descriptive epidemiological analysis and uh, finding out of causative agents, genetic susceptibility and their effects. And actually we are answering the black box of uh, once we expose and before we uh, have the disease outcome, what is going on in the host and the pathogen. Next slide, please. So what are the advantage of molecular epidemiology? It's mainly we disclose role of gene environment interaction and the etiology of the diseases and how it interact with the host. Now also, it reveals complex drivers of disease progression by generating sound evidence about the underlying biological mechanisms. So finally, it provides knowledge for potential primary prevention strategies. Next slide, please. So we are fortunate to have this genomic uh, epidemiology. This is, this is the new era of molecular epidemiology because uh, now we are having a lot of parallel sequencing technologies where you will have genomics performances with a variety of clinical, experimental, and biomedics approaches to rapidly facilitate a more comprehensive understanding of emergent viruses. So this will be the new era of molecular epidemiology and it will uh, facilitate the uh, in finding out of interaction of host pathogen and the immune responses and also innate immunity and uh, predicting the risks of the next pandemics. Next slide, please. So let's look at uh, how uh, these uh, molecular epidemiological tools has been used, have been used uh, for this uh, COVID-19 pandemic. So this is the first uh, short uh, brief report published in New Journal of New England uh, of Medicine. And uh, here they have claimed this, this new uh, coronavirus SARS-CoV-2. They have detected it belongs to different lineage and it's not sharing in the same genomic uh, evidences of uh, SARS and also mass. Next slide, please. So this, this evolution analysis shows that the red color shows the new emerged virus from Wuhan, and also it's clearly differentiated uh, from SARS viruses at the top in the blue color, and also uh, the blue one, the MERS, because it clearly shows that, showed that this uh, new virus, uh, based on the full genome analysis, it is belongs to a, a different clade. Next slide, please. And further to the analysis, uh, this group has done a recombination analysis of the newly emerged virus. And uh, because we all know this RNA virus are very prone for mutations. And that's, the, that's how they uh, maintain the, their uh, variability of the viruses to maintain different kind, type of host. So there can be uh, recombination events happen in the same uh, virus groups, in the subgenus level, cervical virus groups. So they, they, they check that uh, whether this, it is because of the recombination it has happened or it is because of the uh, new strain emerged in, uh, in the virus. Next slide, please. So this analysis shows this is normally, the uh, epidemiology use this simplot and uh, RDP analysis kind of softwares we use to analyze uh, different kind of uh, mutations or the, or the mosaics present in the uh, genome. So it's, it's confirmed that the new SARS-CoV-2 is a not, it's a not a recombinant virus. It is a new clade of virus came from the uh, SARS-like viruses. Next slide, please. And uh, you have been uh, seeing this uh, uh, picture quite often. Uh, you can see now, this, um, uh, this is actually from the Global Initiative of Sharing All Influencer Data uh, and Access yesterday. So as at uh, yesterday, you can see 
there are more than 60,830 full genome sequence already deposited in the gene bank belongs to SARS-CoV-2. And based on the genomic uh, features, they have differentiated into five, seven clades. And uh, initially it was flow clades, and now we can see it is expanding. And now we can see also how much is the speed of uh, depositing the full genome sequence because it is only uh, capable of, because now we have next genome sequencing technology where you have parallel sequencing, you can do 100 to 200 sequencing uh, uh, runs uh, at a time. So it that's enables, especially for the virological research, to have a deep understanding of the virus involved in the pandemics. Next slide, please. So apart from that, I have also saw, uh, seen a question that how we check the validity of the current validated primers that has been used for uh, uh, diagnostics. And we can see that they also keep on monitoring the changes in the target region, especially the primer target regions. The, we are, if there are any changes, they will alert to the teams that the applicability of the primers that has been used for the, to diagnose or detect the COVID-19. So it has been continuously uh, followed by the, this team and we, it's freely available, it's a public domain. So this we can see this initially this uh, database has been started to, to share the influential data as a one health approach. Now they have extended to the uh, current pandemic COVID-19. So it is the advantage that we are having the common platforms. Next slide, please. So this slide shows that uh, there's variations in the main antigenic uh, protein uh, in, uh, that attach with the ACE2 yes. inhibitor in humans. Yes. Is, there any, uh, is there any significant change? Okay, well, no, we can see no, no. and we can also predict the, predict the uh, changes, especially uh, belongs to the main antigenic protein. Next slide, please. This is one of the uh, most uh, cited uh, article published in PNAS. And we can see uh, by the foster group, actually we can see the three groupings of the 160 isolates they have analyzed. Mainly they have categorized A, B, and C. And according to their finding, most of the Asian isolates, East Asian isolates belongs to the B type and the Northern American and the European type of isolates belong to the A and uh, C. So uh, by uh, drawing this kind of uh, diagrams, we can trace the most closest exposure points if we do not document well in the uh, exposures and then also if we cannot trace the origin of the disease. Next slide, please. So this is uh, so one of the findings uh, that I have uh, done uh, using the four uh, full genome sequence uh, deposited from Sri Lanka in the same uh, JS uh, website. So we, as we all know that we know the first local patient reported in March 11th and uh, according to the exposure history, uh, he had exposure from the tourists coming from Europe. And you can see that this uh, the most uh, top uh, triangle red color, that is the isolate coming uh, obtained from uh, the same patient and it is clustered with European uh, countries. So this shows the genomic similarity of the viruses circulating in Sri Lanka. And also this confirmed we have multiple introduction of the virus, not only from Europe, we have evidences coming from China and also from England. So this, uh, this is already in peer review process, this uh, publication. So this is the robustness of the phylogenetic analysis and evolution tools that we can use in descriptive epidemiology. Next slide, please. So as Dr. Kri has mentioned, and the, this is the slide I have taken from OIE, the most 60% of the existing human infectious disease coming as zoonotic and 75 at least uh, emerging infections, also emerging infections for humans like Ebola, HIV, and also influenza. So it's very important to have a, a collaborative approach of veterinarian doctors and the human doctors and also the environment. You know, this is very important because we can see the impact of the 
different ecosystems and the human production system to the health of the people. Next slide, please. Also, this is uh, one of the picture I have collected from OIE website. So this showed that what kind of activities going on in the in uh, in animal health, uh, uh, safeguarding the animal health of the uh, in the planet. So there are different veterinary epidemiological tools used because normally when it comes to poultry, it's something like we are rearing uh, millions of chicken in one location, and we should have high. Uh, biosecurity levels and preventive strategies uh, in production systems to control this. So, so there are many RNA viruses involved in the uh, animal diseases. They might jump into the uh, human uh, as well. So there are strict measures and the uh, monitoring tools has been used in veterinary epidemiology uh, in, in controlling diseases. Next slide, please. So, so as we discussed, uh, this is one of the major disease that we have to address is the rabies. And we can see that we have also observed new uh, Lysa virus and then Professor Osin has uh, explained that. And uh, also the different lineages and the possible uh, evolution of the virus, analyzing the virus and keep on, keep the data up to date is very, very important uh, to have a better understanding of future pandemics. Next slide, please. So this is uh, about the uh, avid influenza, uh, especially this virus is very prone for antigenic shift and the rift and the uh, reassortment of the virus genetic particle. So, so the, most of the uh, consortiums, they keep the up-to-date data and they predict next uh, type of uh, reassortment or the shift or the drift that, that is possible based on these studies. And also they have very good uh, uh, understanding of the genetic variability of the uh, influenza viruses and how it spread to the uh, globe and also the, depending on the vectors or the carriers, how it can uh, uh, spread throughout the planet. Next slide, please. This is also one of the tools that we use to simulate phylogenetic analysis because once when it comes to the animal production, there are many RNA viruses. Uh, they mutate very rapidly and because of that, uh, monitoring of their uh, main antigenic uh, genes and the proteins are very important because uh, uh, mainly those diseases are controlled by vaccines, but there are many vaccine escape mutants that can uh, occur because of, of this uh, ability of the RNA virus. So frequent monitoring of the main antigenic proteins are very important. Next slide, please. So as we discussed all the One Health approach, it's really essential in, in future to have better coordination and communication calibration between different disciplines. Next slide, please. Okay. So thank you very much for your time. So back to Dr. Taranga. Thank you, Dilan. So uh, starting from the overview, we move down to the molecular level. And uh, from the discussions we had so far, it's, uh, there's no debate that uh, the One Health approach is important. And uh, now it's the uh, time. I, uh, we also learned that there have been a lot of activities that had happened within the country and in the globe at uh, FAO and WHO and OIE level as well. So uh, now it's time for us to have an open discussion and to identify the actions that we should take uh, from a professional association point of view and uh, from a, a national level. So to lead the discussion, I now hand over to uh, Professor Sarod Jai Singh. my video thank you very much taranga and thank you once again to all the speakers that was an excellent session uh, from morning we've been uh, we've uh, heard several uh, comprehensive presentations so now it's my pleasure to open the discussion uh, and uh, 
we have we are short of time but uh, let's uh, let's have about 15 minutes of discussion with permission of uh, all the attendees and the participants uh, may i first uh, request uh, dr tikri vijay tilakar to tell us some of his ideas because we've seen the chat box and there are quite a few ideas which uh, which he has uh, put forward uh, would you mind uh, give just uh, outlining some of the actions we could take in future yeah yeah thank you very much for the opportunity yeah uh, actually uh, i have been engaged in one health activities probably since uh, 2006 so locally and internationally but most of the local activities i was partner to that uh, since uh, the emergence of avian influenza so what i have observed was most of these activities were not uh, really sustainable I mean, although uh, many people have done so many things, we have uh, generated a lot of, uh, what do you call, maybe uh, building blocks, but there was no uh, real uh, kind of activity to put all these uh, building blocks together to develop the big picture. I mean, uh, if we take uh, the stakeholders, uh, the stakeholder population, maybe 80 to 90% is represented by governments sector uh, animal health and human health academia so for them to work together there should be some kind of a platform i mean there should be a policy there should be a agreed action plan i mean based on that only i mean i, I used to call it institutionalization i mean because uh, in the past there were a lot of activities have done uh, developed to uh, I mean, uh, provide uh, capacity building like uh, South Asia One Health Platform, uh, Applied Epidemiology Masters established in P, uh, PGIS Peradenia. All these things, I mean, those are bits and pieces. And then there were a lot of recommendations uh, by OIE, PVS, Gap Analysis, IHR, JEE. I mean, now it is time to institutionalize. So my, my uh, request for the professional associations to bring this message to the political authority, uh, provide the good justification first to develop, uh, look at the problem in policy perspective, then uh, based on policies, develop some legal uh, backups, then identify stakeholders, and then go to the development of platform. I mean, it, in, in very brief, I mean, it's a story, very big, big, big book. <laughs> so in brief, yeah, that is my opinion. Thank you, over. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's very useful. So one thing we have uh, identified is uh, for the SLMA and the SLBA to work together. Uh, and as you quite rightly said, uh, we have to develop a, a platform which will help us uh, in future. And probably this is the ideal time because uh, with the COVID, uh, there is a lot of interest and uh, people are thinking of uh, new avenues or new ways of tackling this. So pr this is probably the best time. And uh, uh, is there anyone who will, or even you, Dr. Tikri, whether how we can elaborate on what this platform is? Is it uh, a form of uh, a, within the a Ministry of Health or interministerial or? What do you think we should aim for? Yeah, I think it should be ideally interministerial. Maybe first you can start as a interministerial steering committee because I have seen some examples in Bangladesh and Bhutan. They have already established in Bangladesh. They have established a One Health Secretariat. It's a physical body. Actually, I have seen that is also a kind of obstacle. Because once you develop some kind of a physical structure, then there will be a lot of ownership issues and things like that. So what we have seen, uh, for example, in Sri Lanka, we have been operating this uh, Zoonotic Influenza Technical uh, Committee, National Committee. It is co-chaired by DG, DAPH, and DG Health Services. It started way back in, uh, I think, probably 2008 or so. But until now, every month, third week of every month, it uh, sits together and discuss a lot of issues, surveillance and all these things. So th that kind of arrangement would be more uh, flexible because when we talk about One Health, the number one question uh, issue comes in is the ownership. 
so it is not easy it is not that easy so we have to be very flexible before we are setting up something like cdc in sri lanka so we have to setting up a virtual platform but it has to have a legal backup otherwise it is very difficult you know i mean when we uh, set up this nac amr uh, sometimes in 2017 and developed the national action plan for amr for sri lanka i was a member of that committee but finally we ended up with no money until we get the fleming fund because if this is not being accepted by the government and it is not possible to get money and it is not possible for the government servants to engage in any of these activities so my my answer for that is first starting from a steering committee then you can develop i mean already we have number of uh, such one health steering committees so maybe make it make one of these steering committees a one health steering committee engage with secretaries engage with ministers so from that i mean it is not that easy as well but i think to me that is the uh, first step over thank you thank you very much any other comments uh, professor sunil chandra or any other participants or from the panel right so uh, so certainly we will work on uh, a joint uh, committee of the slma and slva that's one thing then we will see how uh, how this steering committee can come about uh, then there are a lot of experiences from the universities uh, and uh, i think uh, that's something which uh, we should discuss how the universities other than in peradeniya peradeniya has that wonderful advantage of having so many other faculties and expertise there but what about the other faculties how can we join with the uh, for example the vet faculty or other networks uh, which will help our students also any ideas prof sunil do you like to take that I don't think we can hear him. Have you unmuted him, Professor Sunil? Yeah. Now, can you hear me? Yes, yeah. we can hear. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I think uh, for our undergraduate education as well as uh, postgraduate education for medical and veterinary uh, students, we should have some joint modules on one health. I think it has been mentioned that uh, even uh, the curricula at the university level, we should have some modules. I think that. probably can may uh, maybe a trigger in the future collaborations not only that uh, even at the teachers level academia we should have some committees and some joint projects in order to cope with the uh, crisis uh, pu- to prevent future pandemics and then probably what pro- uh, dr tikri mentioned i think we should we should have support from the ministry level as well as gone I think we can uh, even before all these things we can start with the from our universities on the education of undergraduate and postgraduate students thank you very much i think undergraduate is something we'll have to work through probably departments of uh, community medicine or uh, departments which are dealing with microbiology uh, but at the postgraduate level i think we should aim at two uh, in the i'm talking of postgraduate in medicine i'm not talking of postgraduate in the vet sciences but in the medical side the pgim we should probably aim for modules in the community medicine msc md program and also medical administration because they also have a lot of contributions and responsibilities in relation to health uh, of uh, different institutions as well as regions so certainly those are two areas we should uh, see whether even if we have modules which are elective modules to begin with i think that should be useful right thank you very much any other comments uh, you can use your chat function or raise your hand and we'll try to track you down i wonder whether saumya vikramasinghe or prof wilks are available it might be too late for them right now ah yes saumya you are there 
uh, would you like to tell us your experience, please? Yes. Uh, hello. Uh, yeah, I'm also in uh, California, but uh, I can tell you my experience. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Yes. So what I can tell from my brief experience is that if you want to, if you want to have a sustainable One Health education, uh, we need to add, add these uh, One Health modules into the curriculum and then you might have to give some grades to the students because it is really hard for both veterinary and medical students to participate uh, even during our One Health short course because they were very busy with their own curriculum activity. And I know that from University of Peradeniya Faculty of Medicine, uh, one student uh, came to California Davis to get experience. And that student also, it was very difficult for that medical student to get leave and because he was more concentrated on his studies. So I didn't think he get the optimal benefit. So I think, uh, you have to talk with the education department and there should be a common curriculum. And the other thing, it's good to have a, a nice platform where everyone can uh, join together and where we can share our research ideas and our results. So it should be a collective effort uh, with everyone. Hello. Thank you very much. Sorry. Yes, we can hear you. We heard you very well. Thank yeah. you. Uh, just that uh, the, the thing got, went off on my mic. So thank you very much. That's very useful. So we've got yeah. four ideas. The platform. As Dr. Tikiri says, yeah, we need to have a common policy in the country. That's the main, most important thing. I mean, once the leaders, when a leader goes away, we can't have the policy changing. It should be a policy that is uh, sustainable and that will, that will stay even the leaders move out. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Right. Uh, so there are four areas as I see. one is a platform for to increase the interactions. Then uh, we move towards an interministerial committee, uh, like a steering committee. Uh, number three is undergraduate education. And number four is postgraduate education. So those are the areas which uh, we can think of. What about research? Um, Dr. Neranjala, would you like to add or anyone else? What yes, about research? I was waiting if uh, Dr. Ranjani Hetiarach is around, still present. We can hear what she has got to say. Because, uh, they, are, they are representing the state sector. Uh, whatever decisions the professional bodies take, uh, it has to channel through the state sector, you know, the uh, government officials to the ministerial level. Uh, so is Dr. Ranjani around, still present? Um, I don't see her. Anyway, uh, as professional bodies, I think the Sri Lanka Medical Association and Sri Lanka Veterinary Association must take a, a leading role to uh, rope in all the other sectors or other professional bodies and then move forward. And I have seen uh, Dr. Tikiri has sent a nice slide uh, for the discussion. So. Uh, Will it be possible to post it, uh, share that slide? It's talking about the policy levels and uh, the strategy and the action plans um, in a summary form. So it is in the part not, two. Uh, yeah. 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 Dr. Taranga, is it possible to share that slide? Maybe she's, uh, the mic is muted. Oh yeah, there it is. Can Dr. 
Tikiri, elaborate on that, okay. please. Yeah, I mean, this is what uh, I was uh, very briefly telling about, I mean, what could be the approach. I mean, uh, because uh, usually in most of these low and middle income countries, politicians play the biggest role. So, I mean, if we want to have something happen in the country, I think it is the first point to uh, tackle. Uh, because now in Sri Lanka, we have generated uh, more than enough evidence for last several decades. So with these things, I think uh, these uh, two associations can lead in, uh, I mean, uh, making a case uh, to the uh, policymakers, what is the importance and how it is going to help uh, a country like Sri Lanka, because it's an island country. Although it is an island country, it is one of the highest biodiversity uh, I mean, uh, country in, in the world. And it is very easy to get, uh, I mean, any kind of uh, zoonotic disease in this country. And it is in the uh, zoonotic hotspot in the uh, world. I mean, Southeast Asia is the hotspot of zoonotic diseases in the world. So, I mean, uh, then uh, after the policy, I mean, what is the strategy? I mean, whether we need some legal modifications, because for example, if we take Food Act, so Food Act is under the governance of Ministry of Health. So how veterinarians can join implementing Food Act? Because when it comes to uh, food safety issues, so we are talking about farm to fork, but here, what is the authority uh, veterinary service has to implement food that I mean, maybe meat inspection or maybe taking samples at the uh, field level, I mean, to check maybe some pathogenic organisms like salmonella or maybe can we take samples officially to check antibiotic residues. I mean, those are some practical things I'm showing why it is necessary to have this kind of modification. Then uh, action. Then we can, the third step is the action. It is maybe developing platforms, uh, maybe how we can get funding because for example, for this wildlife project, so DAPH got funding, but it is a joint program implemented by Ministry of Health, the Wildlife Department, DAPH and Academia of the University of Peradeni. So something like that. So, uh, I mean, that is what I, I very briefly explained. I mean, this is not a prescription, but this is my experience. Uh, how I felt that uh, why this was not sustainable, why it was not, uh, I mean, f moving forward. Because, I mean, if we take, uh, I mean, uh, the recent example in China was the recent influenza virus detected in uh, pigs. So if, if the veterinary service doesn't have the authority to do this kind of studies, so we may not find this virus. So that is why it is important to have all these uh, legislations, policies, resources, everything in place for uh, state organizations to work because they are the key stakeholders. Uh, and maybe there are a lot of uh, uh, flexibilities required because if we take uh, uh, wildlife, this uh, flora and fauna protection ordinance. So veterinarians cannot take samples from wild animals, although we want to help them to do surveillance. So it is illegal if, if a veterinarian of other department takes a sample from a wild animal. So that is areas that we need some kind of, I mean, those are actually advanced steps, but basically we need uh, the initial uh, kind of a step to uh, start the discussion over. Thank you very much. There is, uh, the, the, we'll look at the other area of research also because there is a, there is there are two or three people who have uh, wanted to speak, but we can't allow everybody. We won't have time. Rasika Jinadasa wants to share the experience on research. Can we have your comments, please? Are you there? Then hello. Uh, yes. Yes. Hello. I, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Uh, thank you. Thanks, everyone. For example, uh, I'm working on uh, zoonotic tuberculosis. Basically, tuberculosis in animals is a zoonotic disease. We have collaborations with the medical faculty in Peradeniya and the IFS for this research for last five years and uh, Department of Wildlife uh, Conservation and uh, Zoological Garden also. Now, we have seen actually that initially when we started looking at it, we did not know much about what are the molecular 
uh, epidemiological patterns of this one. Now, after three years of joint work, we know that there are actually could be two populations of these organisms present in separately present in dry zone and wet zone in the country. And we still don't know whether we have a wildlife reservoir. If we do find a wildlife reservoir, it could be a very devastating situation because if you have a wildlife reservoir with this one, it is technically impossible to eradicate the disease from Sri Lanka. Mm -hmm. The simple as that, if you find an established wildlife reservoir, it would be impossible to eradicate it from Sri Lanka. So this is a very important question that we don't know. So it's joint uh, work is uh, really benefiting actually. We can do further joint, uh, for example, we do not know whether any human cases are caused by uh, embovis in Sri Lanka at the moment. So, so worldwide is I think about 5% or 3% is their worldwide cases. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, I want to ask just one simple question uh, from, from the panel. Uh, that is, uh, what sort of uh, zero epidemiology or uh, epidemiology studies are being done routinely in animals? And how does that information get fed into the health sector? Why I ask that is uh, with uh, Corona, now we've got to think of uh, trying to see, and also Peradenia has already detected a new rabies virus. So now if you are, if, do, do we have a system where animals are being routinely tested in order to predict possible human uh, human epidemics in Sri Lanka. Anyone knows? Dr. Niranjana, are you able to answer that? Is there anything? You are mute. You are on mute, Unmute. madam. Unmute. We can't Hello. hear you. You'll have to tell again because we didn't hear you. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, now okay. okay. Yeah. Now, uh, there had been studies uh, on leptospirosis, uh, brucellosis, uh, also uh, hemorrhagic septicemia. That's, uh, that's, that's not a zoonotic disease. And uh, so those are the, you know, leptospirosis and brucellosis are the zoonotic diseases uh, where serology uh, has been done. And if Dr. Dilan can join me. Um, no, I think the question. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the question is, does it happen routinely? Not, not research. I'm talking of what are the steps which are happening right now to predict human epidemics? Is there and how does it happen? Uh, Dr. Yeah, may I, may I uh, yeah, sure. allow uh, Dr. Dilda, Dilan to continue? So normally, uh, we are in the viral division, they conduct the research not research, actually, they do the frequent uh, surveillance program for influenza. Uh, even influenza, they take samples around 15,000 samples per year from uh, identified locations and also only randomly, not random, for imported uh, production animals, they take uh, random samples and they, they monitor one month uh, before they release into the field. Uh, so they have quarantine uh, fact. Uh, measurements they have taken and also uh, throughout the year they have surveillance program for particular diseases uh, mentioned by Nirangela uh, Medan. So they have routine uh, surveillance programs. Thank you very much. Yes, uh, we are getting some more from the chat box also of the VRI having surveillance programs with uh, dead wildlife and testing cattle for TB and uh, and uh, salmonella testing. So that's, that I, I'm just wondering how we can, uh, how the sectors can work together closely, especially post COVID, because I think we've now got an opportunity to make this connection stronger. So that's why I was asking that question. Right. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I think it's we have to now uh, wind up. It's almost one hour uh, more that we almost one hour over the time limit. Uh, so once again, I would like to thank the the uh, speakers, uh, and we have fifty five participants, which is probably a record for the SLMA's pre congress, uh, going on for three hours. So thank you very much. And uh, may I now hand over to Taranga, who. Uh, Dr. Taranga Toradenia, who was the uh, chief architect of this, who will now uh, give her final comments. Thank you very much once again. Taranga. Uh, thank you, sir. And uh, thank you, everybody, for those uh, wonderful discussions. And uh, yes, of course, uh, from the discussions, uh, we understand that uh, uh, platform starting from top to bottom is really important to ensure sustainability of the work that we are carrying on under One Health umbrella. Uh, without uh, funding, uh, most of these activities may not sustain. Uh, but at individual level, now we saw a lot of enthusiasm from the audience. So at the individual level, I hope each one of you will think uh, how you can act uh, with this, uh, under this One Health approach. Uh, if a patient comes to you, uh, how you would consider uh, to ask certain questions, whether they have been associated with animals and so on and so forth. And then uh, I hope that uh, this will be the start uh, to um, re revive the activities that we have had from Sri Lanka. And uh, SLMA and SLVA hopefully will uh, join hands to create a common platform uh, to take these words forward. And uh, I thank again all the speakers, despite the time differences for joining us for a very productive discussion. And uh, we all learn together. And uh, I'm happy uh, that uh, all of you were with us till the end, which went on uh, nearly three hours. So uh, thank you once again. And uh, thank you for the people who were behind the show for managing uh, the technical platform. And uh, Professor Saroj, uh, Dr. In Professor Indika, Dr. Niranjala, and the entire team uh, for supporting us to put, the, uh, put this great program together today. So with that, I think it's time to say uh, goodbye for this uh, webinar, but I'm sure all of you will be with us. Uh, for, uh, uh, for future activities. Uh, thank you very much and bye-bye. Yeah, thank you, bye-bye.